It's good to be here. Thank y'all for letting me come back, and I appreciate y'all so much. And uh, um, I just want to get right into it. What? Y'all are just standing so polite. Am I supposed to do something? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Y'all are so funny. Y'all are so funny. I didn't know I was going to be here until yesterday. And it's something because it, you would think that I had planned this because the guys are off it for a warrior retreat. And we're going to have our own little warrior retreat right here tonight, y'all. And um, anyway, uh, just to, we'll, we'll, we'll do the scripture here in a little while. But I want to I kick it off and give you a foundation of this. Um, Several years back, I saw this book. It's called The Soul of Battle by Victor Davis Hanson. A great book. A great book. And I bought it specifically because of General Patton. I am a fan of Patton, World War II, and all of that. And the way that he operated, he was just a military genius. And drove the political people up the wall, but he was a military genius. And... Uh, Anyway, I bought this book. Well, being a Southerner, I had, I, when I bought it, I almost didn't buy it because of this man right here. And y'all probably don't know, and, but that is William Tecumseh Sherman. Now, being from the South, we grew up with him in our history books that he was a madman, just blitzed across the Southern just raping and pillaging and murdering and, and all of that stuff. And his name has just, I almost didn't buy the book because of what I had been taught about this man. And uh, so, but I, I went ahead and got it and I ended up reading, when I got to reading about the, the middle of this book is about, it's about three warriors. The one of them is this Epimenidas, or it's hard to say, Greek, a Greek guy that with a bunch of slaved farmers went against the Spartans. How many of y'all know who I'm talking about when I said the Spartans? I'm telling you, warriors that was raised to be warriors never been defeated. And he defeated the Spartans with a bunch of farmers. Yes. And then William Tecumseh Sherman, who literally stopped, he ended the Civil War with what he did. I'll get into that in just a little bit. And then Patton. And it's the soul of battle is called because these men learned that if there was a righteous cause and you went with a, and he, that freedom, God will always protect freedom. If there's anyone that'll have a righteous cause, that'll make a stand for something that will set people free instead of putting people in bondage. And every one of these men set people free. Now, what I found out about William Tecumseh Sherman is that I'm ashamed of what I was taught. Now, we'll, we'll take this and, and, and tonight and, and put it out on my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is uh, Cowgirl Logic, if you ever want to go there. And uh, so for all of my Southern friends, just hang with me because you're going to learn something different tonight. And I'm not just going to give you a history lesson. This has something to do with us. Us, okay, will y'all stay with me? Okay, so anyway, William Tecumseh Sherman, he graduated from West Point, and uh, after his graduation, uh, well, you know what? We'll get into that in a minute. I want to just, I want to jump to the end of the war. The end of the Civil War on May the 24th, 1865, William Tecumseh Sherman's men marched down Pennsylvania Avenue. 62,000 men in three groups marched down Pennsylvania Avenue with a lot of other people and a lot of blacks that had joined them and, and in, in, in their, uh, uh, their quest. Anyway, it, it, it was such an immense army. Think about this, 62,000 men. It took them six and a half hours to finish the parade of, those, of just his army. 
Okay, and at and at the end of uh, through through this parade, I gotta. It, it people would say they were amazed. They stood and nobody left for six and a half hours. Nobody left while these men walked marched by and they said these men were wilder, more rugged, better disciplined and more lethal than any army that they had ever seen. A, Germ a German ambassador was there and he remarked as the first group which was the 15th Corps went by and he said, quote, an army like that could whip all of Europe. When the second group, the 20th Corps went by, the, the Gem German ambassador said an army like that could whip the world. When the last group, the 14th Corps, marched by, he said, an army like that could whip the devil. They had never seen an army like that. And um, Sherman, what, what, that is the end of the story. And we always like to hear about how people succeed. But maybe we need to hear about what brought him to that level of success, okay? And his story was amazing to me. Again, if you want to check it out, get this book, The Soul of Battle, Victor Davis Hansen, great historian. Anyway, when, when he uh, graduated from West Point, then uh, his peers, McClellan and Lee and Grant and so many others, they all was involved. They, got, they, they were involved in the Mexican War. He got sent to be, oh, what's the word? Let me see. I, got, I wrote it down over here. He was, he was uh, a, a commissary duty. <laughs> he was stationed in commissary duty to figure out how much groceries they should get and, and, and all of this stuff. And while all of his peers were off getting uh, promoted into higher ranks, he stayed a captain doing menial tasks. He wrote home to his wife and he said, I wish I was just even out of the army. I just, he said, it just, it, it just pains me to see that I, that I, I can't be involved in anything worth anything. I'm over here counting potatoes, basically, you know, and all of that. Well, he went through time of such depression because of this that he literally, uh, basically later on even contemplated suicide. He, in the, in the span of 15 years, went through something like a dozen jobs and failed at several of them. And, but some of the things that he did, which we need, I need to bring up because um, it's important that some of the things that he did was uh, he was given charge of feeding the army and making sure that, that uh, there were enough rail cars and all that assigned to meet the needs of the army. He was on commissary duty and purchasing supplies for the army out of Saint, from St. Louis. Then they sent him down south and he was a surveyor for the south through Georgia and through the Carolinas. And then he was set on, on uh, desk jobs and over army statistics and then he was sent and he was helping to build railroads and he went all out in the west but all through the south okay on all these jobs that he thought and he considered was dead end no go nowhere jobs okay to the point and then he quit the army because he was so sick of it of not doing anything and he was considered by even all of his peers and even his wife that he was a failure all right and so the gold rush hit. And a friend of his said, come on out to California. And he, and he started up a bank on the gold rush. Well, it, the stock market and everything dropped, the, everything. And he had, he had talked to some of his friends from school and, and all that and had them to invest. And, they, and he lost all his money and some of his friends lost their money. And even though that was no fault of his, he had such integrity that he worked for years until he paid every one of his friends back for the money that they lost over an investment that he encouraged them to make that was none of his fault. But through all of this, with banks closing everywhere, he was, he was one of the only ones that kept his bank afloat. But it, it was not a success. 
So he told his wife, he wrote back several times, he just wanted, to, he, he just thought that maybe the world would be better if he committed suicide. But then he, he had several kids and he thought, I can't, he told his wife, if it wasn't for you and my kids, I would just, you'd be better off without me. And he was, he was just, went through bouts of depression. Well, then the Civil War started up, all right? And, uh, and he got a command, but then they thought he was crazy, and they took the command away from him and all. And, and, uh, but later on, as the war wore on for like three years, this is what hit him. Amongst all of the other generals, he was the only one because he had lived. Oh, I forgot to tell you this. This is important. The, one of the last jobs that he had before the war started was he was in Lake, Lake Charles, Louisiana. He was down there at LSU. Started, LSU had a military college, and they hired him as their first superintendent of LSU. I'm, I'm used to LSU because uh, the Louisiana High School Finals and all is at Lake Charles and all of that. Did you know it's, they've all the superintendents, they've honored all the superintendents. There's names around town of all of the ones that have had part of their military and this and that. And he was the first one to be the superintendent over that college, but they have stricken his name off of everything. I mean, they ain't going to have his name on nothing. All right, his name is Mud. He absolutely loved the South. He, he resonated more with Southern people. And, uh, and so he finally had a great job. It was a high paying job for that day. Finally had a nice house, great paying job. And it lasted about one year. And the Civil War started. And the South offered him, a, offered him the opportunity to be the general over their entire Southern army. But he knew something. He knew that if this nation divided, she would not stand. And there was something else about him. They can vilify him all they want, but the man hated slavery. Hated slavery, didn't own any slaves. Lee, on the other hand, who we think is so genteel and all that, he owned slaves. Matter of fact, let me tell you something else, because I'm all you Southern people watching this, just hang on. Because <laughs> I'm from the South, and Lee is the one that is the hero in the South. Lee, they, uh, they offered Lee during the Civil War, they said, we will turn loose, we will return some of, of our prisoners of war back to you if you will just quit shooting the blacks when you see them. And Lee would not do that. He let his own men stay in prison camps because he was still intent on just if they found a black person, you know, that had escaped from the South, they shot him. And uh, we don't see, you don't read that in your history books and all because we tend to make like if a person is, think about this, y'all. If a person is genteel, well-spoken, refined, People will fall for that person and follow them more so than by their actions. Listen, look at the political scene. People will, will, will uh, be, you know, backwards at someone that, it, that speaks more raw or whatever, <laughs> like our President Trump right now. I don't know about y'all, but I love him, and I love he says what he thinks, and he don't lie, you know? But thank you. But anyway, um, let me get off of Lee, you know, because he, he, was, he was a great general and all. But we, Sherman has got horribly overlooked. Okay, it's all going to make sense. Hang with me. Y'all still hanging with me? All right. Okay. Anyway, I never, li I never liked history when I was in school because all they did was make us memorize dates and stuff. I didn't give a rip about dates, did y'all? I was just interested in getting a date, you know? <laughs> Right? <laughs> so anyway, now I'm thinking, man, I love this history thing if it had been taught with some, you know, with some meat in it. Anyway, okay, so he's at the best job of his life. He's finally hit success. And now he's got to find out, will he turn his back on what he knows is right to keep his success and to, and to keep what he's got 
the, the job of his, of, of his dreams or will he sacrifice his own best comfort and issues and best w for his family to do what is right for a nation? And he turned it down because he knew that, that, th that the union had to stay union, that we couldn't divide. This nation would not survive if we divided. And he also knew that if slavery wasn't ended, that it would ruin this, fam this nation, okay? So anyway, he turned it down. All right, the war went on for something like three years or whatever. The South had lost, but with their pride and all, they just wouldn't quit. So the South was literally sending in old men and little boys with muskets and stuff and pitchforks, y'all, to go on frontal attacks against an army that had the uh, Stevens gun. I think it was Stevens. I, I wrote it down. But anyway, it was like seven shot gun. And there was no way. It was just they were getting butchered, you know. Well, Lee and Grant was, was in, entrenched up there close to Richmond. It had been months. Another thing, there, and it's, it's a fact, more soldiers on both sides died from sickness and disease in the entrenchment than they did from the bullets. In, and, and so uh, Sherman knew that camping and, and an entrenchment was not healthy on your army, that an army needed to move. And so he, he knew the South. I mean, he'd gone all through the South, surveying all through Georgia, the Carolinas, and everything else on all these quote-unquote dead-end jobs, okay? And so he, he talked to Grant and President Lincoln, and he said, cut me loose and let me go down to the South. He said, because basically the South had lost, but they wouldn't quit. We're all stubborn, okay? The South had lost, was lo had lost, but they just wouldn't admit it and wouldn't quit. And so they were, they were just brutalizing their own people. And he was sick of the bloodbath. He was just sick of it. And so he knew, he knew that, that greater than, than killing masses of people, that the way to kill that idealism that the South had, that they had swallowed, that was to go down and go into the South and make the people who had started the war, who still hadn't felt any pain from the war, make them pay. He knew that he had to do two things. He had to purge the South of their pride and cut their economy devastate their economy. And if he could devastate their pride and devastate their economy without taking as many more lives than he could, than, than would have to be taken, the war could be stopped indirectly. And so what it, because see, well, a lot of people, maybe you hadn't thought about it, but the South, South Carolina seceded basically only because the plantation owners, when President Lincoln offered to give subsidies to, to get slavery worked out, if you just take it out of your system, you're going to have economic devastation. So they was going to work it out of them and, and give them subsidies and get them free of the slavery and get these people educated and get them into the society to where they are prospering the nation too. But the South said, we don't want none of it. Well, it was only the plantation holders. That was the only ones that mattered. And so they're the ones that said, we have secede. But guess what? They didn't go to war. Even their sons, they would pay other, other young people Farmers that was poor white folks that had a boy, they would pay, we'd give this farmer so much money and you send your boy off to war and keep mine here. So basically all the war was up north and they were devastating the farmers up north. They were burning and pillaging farmers up north, but the south, nobody had touched it. Sherman said, I'm going to go in and I'm going to pierce the shell of the south and I'm going to prove that it's hollow. The confederacy is hollow. He knew this. He knew that when he set out that he would have absolutely no supplies. Guess what? One of the things that his jobs, he had to know how many carloads of supplies it would take to, to keep so many men and their animals from starving. Wow, that come in handy right then, didn't it? Yeah. And, and also he talked to Grant and Lincoln and he said, cut me loose. 
Let me go down into the belly of, and he, and he said this, he said, I will make Georgia howl. And he did. And, and he said, they have, you know, sure, uh, Patton said, the uh, war is hell. That quote came from Sherman. Patton studied Sherman. Patton learned his blitz of moving his army from Sherman. Sherman was a, basically a military genius, and he understood the mindsets of people. He spoke a harsh word, but he actually had a kind heart. He was the one. He had General Johnston totally surrounded and was gonna, could annihilate him, and he, turned, he let them loose because he knew the war was going to be over in just a few weeks, and he did not want any more slaughter. He was sick of it. And he wrote, down, wrote back to his wife and he said, if I can win, this war can be won by maneuvering and I'll fight when I have to, but if I can avoid killing, I'm going to avoid it. You don't hear that in your, in your history books, do you? So anyway, he, he talked to Sherman, I mean, he talked to uh, Lincoln and Grant and Lincoln and Grant both didn't want him to do it. And Lincoln said, I fear that he's gone down in a hole and he may never surface again because he was going into the belly of enemy com com uh, country with no contact. They were cutting all the uh, lines of contact, no supplies, no ammunition given. And he knew that all they had to do, all the South had to do was burn their crops ahead of them and they would have starved out and been defeated right then. But he also knew that the, South, the Southern plantation holders would not burn their crops. He knew, they, that they, he knew that they prized possessions more than the lives of those that they said that they were honorable to. And he banked on what he knew about them that they wouldn't do it. And so they let him go. He goes to Atlanta and he, and uh, run everybody out, burned the city. I mean, burned everything. They, 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 cause it was the ammunition place. He knew, listen, if you're going to win a war, you've got to cut off the enemy's supplies. Listen, if you're going to win the war in your life, you've got to cut off the enemy's supplies. If you're going to win the war that's the war in your mind, the war that's in your household front, you find out where that, where that supply is coming in at, cut it off. When you cut it off, you can defeat the enemy. We want to win a war by being nice to the, to, to the enemy that's causing us to be devastated. You, you know, guys, we, I came down with the girls in, in here and so many people in here, they, they know, I don't know personally about drugs, but so many people in here, y'all do. You can't play with drugs, can you? You can't just say, well, I'm just going to have a little bit. I'll just, I'll, I just won't, you know, I'll just have a little bit. Can you do that and succeed? No, you have to cut off the what? Supply. You want to win, you cut the supply off. You, you stay away from the supplier. Anyway, so he, they burned Atlanta and all of that. This is amazing because, <laughs> because Sherman had built railroads, helped build railroads. He knew how to tear up railroads and he knew that if they just tore up the lines, the Southerners would come right behind them and just put them back in place. But he, because he built it, he knew where their weak joint was. And so he listened to this because it's going to be amazing how many miles they marched while they did this. They, he put his companies out in several areas. They, they would even be like 60 miles wide from one another, but they had runners in between and they kept in contact. And they stayed on the rivers and they stayed on the, uh, uh, the railways and they would tear up the ties, stack the ties and then put the rail, the rails on top of the ties, set the ties on fire, let the rails get so hot that then they could twist them. And once they twisted them, there was no fixing it. Now get this, they did that and still covered 10 miles a day, 62 thousand men. How do you do that in places where there's not even roads? It's amazing what he did. So he did, they did that. They tore up their lines. So now the North, they don't have supply lines. 
And then they, they fed off of the southern crops. He knew that it would take so many thousands of pounds a day of stuff to feed what he had. I mean, statistically, it was, a, it was, a, it was an amazing thing to do. And, and I don't know that anyone else in American history at that time could have done it. The only way he was capable of doing it was because he had gone through all those failures. And then, and you know what, uh, I, I want to call this and you can put that up there if you want, but this, this sermon is called faithful failures, faithful failures, because every one of the failures, quote unquote, that he had was exactly the training he needed to do the one job that no other, no other military man on the face of the earth at that time could do. But that man right there, that man right there. Because of all the things, and guess, he had surveyed all the South. So guess what he would do? <laughs> he, he wrote and told his wife, he said, everywhere I go, I feel like I've been here before. Because he probably had. And this is what he'd do, because he wanted to save lives. He would mass his army, and he would aim them for a big city. And all of the Confederate soldiers would come from everywhere, barricade around that city, and then he'd just bypass them. And go on down and keep tearing up railroads and burning up crops that they didn't eat. They'd eat everything and burn up what they couldn't take. They shot every bloodhound and every dog that they come across. And you write that in the history books and, oh, he was a butcher. He shot people's pets. No, he shot the dogs that were used to hunt down runaway slaves and, and, and union soldiers that had escaped from POW camps. They couldn't, there wasn't a hatred out of the dogs. It was a love for a people to save a people's life. And so they would, they would forage and live off the land, keep marching, tearing up railways 10 to 15 miles a day, 62,000 men. Matter of fact, I want to, I, I wrote down, I, I think I wrote down, let me see, I think it's right here. Uh, how many, how many, uh, yeah, here it is. He, um, more, he knew that it would take, listen to this, over 80 rail cars a day of food to keep over 60,000 men from starving. They had 14,500 horses when they began, 19,500 mules, 5,500 head of cattle, and 62,000 men, and they marched 10 miles a day while they pushing 5,500 head of cattle a day and tore up the railroad lines. Now that is something else, y'all. That's amazing. And he did it to save lives and to stop a war. But he couldn't have done it if he hadn't gone through every single one of those failures. Every one of those failures led to the, what he was destined to succeed at that saved a nation. And at the end of this, 500 and some odd miles down to Savannah. And when they got to Savannah, they, they under protest, they, they just... Well, evident, it, it was basically abandoned by any, uh, the military had gone. Oh, and I need to say this, at one town, Milling, Millingville or something like that, oh, I could look it up, but it, it, anyway, they, uh, a bunch of, one section of his men had just sat down to rest a while, and they had laid their guns aside, and all of a sudden, they were attacked with uh, amount of men that was like double their, there was 1,500 of those guys and it was like at least double their size, just a, attack. And it, they just methodically grabbed their guns, got in a line and, and, went, and because their firepower was superior, they could start taking them out at 250 yards. When it was over, they walked through it and there was 650 Confederates dead and almost all of them were old men and little boys. And it broke their heart. And one of the soldiers said, I hope to God we never have to kill men like this again. And you think that it didn't cause a passion to burn those plantations all the way down? Because it was those, it was, it was the rich elite that lived totally secure, they sent everyone else off to war, and they stayed unmolested th 
through three years of the war until Sherman. No wonder the South hates him like they do. He hit them where it hurt. They went into Savannah and took over that, and there was all kinds of, I mean, ammunition and car, uh, railway cars and just book. They literally come out. This, this mission did not cost the Union anything. He actually made the Union money. When they got through with the march, well, at that one attack that I just told you about, there was 650 of the Confederate soldiers dead, and they lost, they, only about 100 of their own were killed. And through the whole entire march, there was only about 100 men that were killed. Now, people that say, oh, they raped and pillaged, they said that all they could find was there was possibly six rapes, and he killed every one of the guys that did it. I mean, he, he wouldn't put up with it. And it, it wasn't anything that my Southern history books taught me about. But the point, it affected me so much when I started reading this because I also saw that this is a prophecy of our day and our time. God is building an army. And you and I will go through several tests. And some of our tests will be heartbreaking failures. And you're going to want to quit. As I say, throw your sucker in the dirt and go home. Or worse, commit suicide. You're going to want to just quit. Quit pressing forward because it's easier to just take a victim attitude and curl up in the side and just, just, just die on the inside even while you stay alive. You know what I'm talking about. There will be several tests in life, but if you're going to make an army of God that's worth its salt, you're going to pass these tests. Amen. And you're not only going to pass these tests, but you're going to give them over to God and let God take your failures and make a success out of what you failed at. <laughs> then there'll be another test. At least two that I'm thinking of now that applies to this. There's probably lots more. But that will be your, your test of success. When you come to finally breaking over into, oh, dear Lord, thank you. Something's finally working. And then you have to make the choice. Will you hold to integrity and kill that thing that is given you? Or will you, can you walk away from what is finally rescuing you out of the wilderness that you've been walking through? If you have to, will you lay it down for what is right? Now, there's men in the Bible that we know of that, that has, has walked this journey before. And um, one of them uh, comes to my mind is Abraham. Abraham was promised that son, you know, and he goes through all of those years and finally he, he, you know, and he thinks that Ishmael is it and Ishmael ain't it. And, and then he finally has Isaac. And then when he gets the son of his promise in his old age, what does God ask him to do? Lay him down, sacrifice, and will you, will you give him up? And it says Abraham didn't even argue. He just rose up the next morning. I bet he didn't tell Sarah where he was going and what he was doing. Well, you bet. Because who wants a mama bear on your butt, right? Anyway, he rose up and never argued. And he goes. And the Bible in Hebrews said that he believed God so much that he believed that if I kill my son, God will raise him from the dead. And God goes, I can use that man. That man can be the head of a covenant that won't break. Because God found a man who would give up his son that God had legal right to give up his son. Because God found a man on the earth that would believe that God would raise his son from the dead, God now had legal right to raise his son from the dead. You see, it was all a mastermind of the greatest military genius the world will ever know, and it's God the Father. It's God. He's the, he's the genius. He's a military genius. And, and all. So what did, what did Abraham do if he could have held on to his son, but he did not, didn't he? And he started to do it. And God said, whoop, whoop, don't do it. 
And he, he put, he had a ram with his horns cut in the thorn, uh, caught in the thorns. And then what did God crown his own son with? Thorns. The Lamb of God was crowned with thorns. God laid all of this out and the devil is such a dope. He let it happen and helped it happen and walked right into the trap, right? I mean, and so the thing is, is that God, uh, God said to Abraham then, he said, now I know you're a man of covenant and I can trust you. Because see, I like what Rick, uh, Rick Joyner says. He says, there comes a time in your life where you got to know, are you serving the vision of the Lord or are you serving the Lord of the vision? Because it can get to where God goes to prospering you and gives you a ministry or gives you this and that. And then God says, lay it down and go do this. Oh, no, no. Bite off devil in the name of Jesus. Get behind me. And we hold on to something that gives me a feeling of success and, and uh, gives me an identity that I hold on to and I like. Are we serving the vision of the Lord? over the Lord of the vision. There's people who split churches apart over their vision of the Lord. Come on. Well, I'll bless God. They just won't let me have, I'm just, I'm just gonna go and, and do my thing and take half the church with them. That's somebody, you follow them and you're stupid. You're stupid because you're following somebody who is serving a vision that they call the Lord's and not the Lord of the vision. Will, are you not only willing to make it through multiple failures, but can you make it through success? Another one is, is uh, a Joseph. He talk about going through failures, Right? Heartbreak and failures and losses and stripped of everything. And he finally gets a place. <sighs> he sat at the top of Potiphar's whole business. He's, he lives in a nice house. He's not watched over. Everything that Potiphar owns is at his hands. And then comes along Potiphar's wife. And says, lie with me. And I tell you what, he ain't no dummy. He knew that day when he run off, she would say, rape, rape. He tried to rape me. And he knew that he would probably get killed. The very reason he didn't get killed was proof that Potiphar knew his wife was lying. But he had to put him in prison because of the embarrassment of admitting publicly that his wife was a mm hmm He walked away from finally, approximately, I don't know how many years, and he finally gets a break. And then he has this choice. You either lay with me and have sex, and she's probably good looking. I'm sure she smelled good. <laughs> and he would have favors given on him, and he could stay in that cushy environment. And she looked good. And he wasn't able to have, he hadn't been having a chance not to have sex, I'm sure, especially not with somebody that was at that caliber. Come on, do it, man. Do it. You're an idiot. If you don't, she's going to accuse you and it's gonna, you're going to go right back to the hog pit. You're going to serve the vision of the Lord or the Lord of the vision. That's where the rubber meets the road, y'all. Your motives and my motives will be tested. They will be tested. Because we can think so many things, but until you walk through that place to where you feel like you're getting gutted to do the right thing, but you do it anyway, you've passed a massive test. Amen? So, I... I uh, I don't know if I wanted to say any more of this or not. No, probably not. The thing is, is that uh, God is building an army. I want to be in an army that the Lord in all of heaven looks and says, an army like that will whip the devil. 
The Bible says that Jesus was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Why do you think what God wants to do when he manifests in us? It's the same purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. God is building an army that is going to cause all of hell to shake in its boots. They're scared of us already because they're so afraid of what we might catch a hold of. But the devil is screaming at you and I about our failures. Well, you can't. God ain't going to do this. Look at what you've done. No, 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 no. You failed at this. You failed at that. You, 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 you don't even keep your dishes washed. You think you're going to defeat the world? Well, only by grace, right? All right. And then another thing, too, is this. Some of you are called to be leaders. You can't lead an awesome army while you're second rate. God's going to have leaders. He's calling us for integrity. He's calling us to a higher standard than the world, not because we have to to have the love of God, but because we want to because of the love of God. I don't want to obey because I have to. I want to obey because he loves me so much. I want to, right? He's building an army and it's going to shake all of the world. What makes a good leader and a warrior? Let me read this. I think I'm going to, um, let me read this. I think, I think, I think. Um, here. It says, um, no, that ain't what I wanted to read. Never mind. What makes, what makes a good leader? What makes a good warrior? Someone who has walked through multiple failures and hasn't given up. You're still walking. You're still walking. So this is my... This is, my, this is my question to you. You know what? This is an altar here. Y'all are very accustomed to the altar, and I love Rock Church because of this. But sometimes we can get the attitude that the altar is only to come and receive. But think about it. The altar that was built in the Old Testament was to come and lay down. You put a sacrifice on that altar. Now, Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, and we can't, we don't even, we ain't supposed to try it, right? But the thing is, is like in Luke chapter 2, well, I've said this many times, and I may have said it here, but it, it goes well. In what we call the Christmas story, and it says that Mary wrapped Jesus in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. He was born in a stinky old cave with sheep poop and cow manure, and he was put in a feed trough, y'all. And it says she laid him in a manger or in the feed trough because, because God chose him to be born there. No, it says because there was no room made for him anywhere else. So this is what I'm saying. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me one day over that scripture. And he said, I don't care how many failures, how humble your situation is, how far you've fallen, how many times you have, picked, you have found yourself in the ditch. He said, if you will make room for me, I will manifest myself wherever anyone makes room. So tonight, this is where our altar call is. If we want to go on with God, there's a scripture that we need to learn how to, I'm, I'm actually going to open the Bible. Amazing. At the, end, at the end of this sermon, put up the King James Version of Romans 8, 28. And y'all know that scripture and you could quote it with me, couldn't you? And we know that all things, how many things? All. Oh, just your successes? You mean even your failures? All. All things. You mean your brilliant things? All. Or your stupid things? 
yeah. Ain't it good to know that all things God can work together for good. Say, look to your neighbor and go for good. To those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. How many of y'all are called to the purposes of God? How many of y'all love the Lord? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, I want to read this. One more. I want to read it out of the Passion. Put it up there in the Passion. I'll just read it off of this. Put it up there in the Passion. I love it in this. Uh. So we're convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. And we are, for we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. Woo! Yeah. Now the thing is, God didn't cause all those things. You know, I, you know, I think it was, uh, it was uh, the Duke, John Wayne, who said life is hard, but it's harder when you're stupid. <laughs> right? <laughs> that pretty well says the truth right there. A lot of this stuff, God didn't do it. We made some bad choices, didn't we? And there was some evil people maybe around you that made choices for you. That, that you suffered the consequences of. But how many things will God work for, his, for, his, for your good? All. How many? All. Do you really believe it? Yeah. You know what? If you and I really believe it, we would never grumble a day in our lives. When we are facing bills and we don't know where the money is going to come from, we would never grumble because we would know that what? How many? Th- all. all things work together for what? For good. And, and that God, God can use our failures, faithful failures. This, this night, I want us to come to the altar and we're going to give the Lord our failures and we're going to give him whatever successes we have. Lay it all down. God, I want to make room for you. How many of y'all have failed in marriage? I failed in marriage couple times. Yeah. How many of y'all have failed in, in your families, failed in decisions, failed in businesses, failed in school? <laughs> well, at least you can repeat that one. <laughs> I want, if you are serious about walking after God, Come on up with some music here because we're going to go ahead. We're going to have an altar call and we are going to say, God, quit moaning over your dadgum failures. I am preaching to me now. I'm pointing my finger at you, but really this is about me. (laughs) Quit moaning over your failures. God's bigger than your failures. My failures. God can use my failures like he did Sherman's. And and find out that God is so awesome that he can even turn my failures into something that needed to be done to get me where I got to be. God's that awesome. Because why? Because he's a military genius, y'all. He knows how to defeat the devil. And if you and I will lay down our failures, our successes, our discouragement, all of those that you want and you go, I have failed at this or that or the other, and I want to lay it down tonight. Get yourself up here. Get yourself up here. Find a corner. We're not in this. I want you just to get up here, and I want you to start just saying the Lord. I want to say to the Lord, God, I give you. I give you my failed marriages. I give you my failed attitudes, failed businesses. I've sucked at some things, y'all. I want to lay it down and give it to the Lord and say from this day forward, from this day forward, by the grace of God and the help of the Lord Jesus, I'm going to stop using those failures as an excuse to say God can't do this or that with me can't use it as an excuse. If you're using it as an excuse, you're embracing, you're embracing a victim spirit. If we use our screw ups or what's been done to us as an excuse, we have embraced a victim spirit that will make sure you and I never taste success in the things of God. I'm telling you what, I don't want to give the devil that. I don't want to give him nothing. 
I'm tired of giving him even my failures. Letting the devil beat me over the head with my failures. No more. Say no more. No more. Anyone in here that says, I don't know if I know Jesus for sure as my Lord and Savior. While you're up here, or you get up here and you just come down here and say, Lord, I give you me. I give you me. Jesus, I give you me in exchange for you. But this night, this night, God is going to turn some failures into some mighty warriors. And I want to be one of them, y'all. I want to be one of them because I'm not good enough in myself. But He can make all things good. So we say, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh oh come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Some of you have sacrificed your children in failures. And I'm here to tell you God wants to give your family back to you. He wants to heal. He wants to turn around those terrible defeats into something that could that is stronger in a family unit than what it's ever been and what you could ever imagine if that's you i want you to lift your hands right now i want you to lift your hands right now and i want you to say jesus i give you my children i want you to say jesus i give you my failures with my children i want you to say jesus turn it around for good Turn it around for good. Your word says that all things, all things, Lord, my children are part of your heart. Strong, you love them more than I do. So, Lord, in the name of Jesus, do what man cannot do and restore family. Restore family. Restore family. Restore family. Father, we call them home in the name of Jesus. We call them in. We call them in in the name of Jesus. We call our kids in to be warriors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We call our kids to come out of the of the gutters of failure and come into the presence. In the name of Jesus, we call for our kids to have encounters with the Lord Jesus Christ. God encounters. God encounters.